So, good afternoon, and I want to welcome to our first talk in the year 2024. Welcome, Emanuele Naboni. It's a pleasure having you here, almost live in our module. Um, we are looking forward to your talk on regenerative architecture, and before that, I would like to shortly introduce you. Emanuele Naboni is a professor, he is a researcher and an architectural technologist. Since 2023, he has been a faculty at the Norman Foster Institute in Madrid. And since 2023, he has also been an adjunct professor in Sydney, working with Professor Santa Morris. So far, he has been a module leader of the Postgraduate School of Sustainability together with Mario Cucinella. And since 2010, Emmanuel has held the position of Associate professor, professor of Building Technology at the Royal Danish Academy. He has co-taught architectural technology courses all over the world, also with NASA, with Speak, with CITA and the Ladybug Tools team at different times. He is a researcher working on various topics related to climate change. That is also the reason why we have in, him invited to our module to speak about his work and his opinions related to climate change. As a, professor, as a professional, he was the design leader at the Performance Design Studio of SOM after starting his practice and consulting for more than 50 built master plans. So currently he is teaching regenerative architecture in, in various universities. Right now he is calling or having the talk from Dubai. So welcome Emanuele, we're looking forward to your talk. Okay. Uh... Thank you very much, Sandra. It's a pleasure to be invited in your, uh, uh, I would say, amazing format. Uh, I've been uh, following uh, a little bit of uh, the activity of the course, and I believe that uh, all of you are very lucky to be in it. Uh, it's nice to have uh, uh, a course that hosts um, different uh, thinking, uh, different ideas, and different uh, uh, interpretation of architecture. So thank you so much for this uh, opportunity and hi to all the uh, attendants. I'll share my screen and uh, uh, begin the presentation. Um, yeah, so. Okay. So uh, today we talk a little bit about uh, climate change and regenerative uh, architecture in um, uh, in an informal uh, setting, in a way, uh, feel free at any time uh, to uh, interrupt uh, for question or uh, place your question at the end. Uh, lately, uh, I noticed that there is less uh, tendency of students to ask questions, uh, but let's see how it goes uh, in this format. Um, okay, so as said by uh, Sandra, I have uh, a few uh, few tasks. Earlier on, I was working at uh, ATH uh, Singapore uh, City in uh, uh, Future City Lab and at the PFL in, uh, in Lausanne for uh, three or four years. I'll show also some output of that. Um, uh, but my primary education crown come from uh, University of Berkeley and the Berkeley Lab, where I was first exposed uh, to science. Um, and uh, along the path, especially working with Skidmore and Merrill, uh, I began to think on how to transfer uh, science um, and the discovery related to thermodynamics, uh, uh, climatic matters and climate change matters, how to bring them uh, into architecture. So I, uh, I also have a practice um, uh, and in between, uh, let's say, research, practice and teaching, I'm involved uh, in different country, um, trying to get a little bit of the best uh, uh, from uh, all of them. So it's very interesting to have this type of approach because from every context, it's possible to inherit some sort of knowledge to be spent uh, somehow uh, elsewhere. I would like to start from the definition of sustainability. 
uh, wondering if that is still um, a currency. Um, and um, wondering if it's still enough to just uh, uh, create a neutral impact on the environment or not create any damage on the environment or not to create any damage to people or just consume less energy. Uh, so this approach, um, which began to be a bit old as it was coined in 1987, um, it's perhaps uh, revised uh, uh, by the regenerative uh, approach uh, that as you may uh, be aware comes from ecology, which is about not to just uh, uh, not uh, interfere with ecology, but it's about becoming collaborative with the ecological matters, with the ecosystem, uh, with human, uh, with human uh, char characterization, and also with the cycle of carbon. Um, so from one side, there are uh, sites, uh, there are systems that need to be recovered. Um, and that is what uh, many meant as restorative design. When we look into regenerative design, uh, it is about uh, uh, discretize uh, what is happening into nature or into the metabolism of cities, and try to find solution that uh, nutrish the quality of the ecological system, that produce more energy than the one that they consume, and that they are salutogenic. They create health uh, for uh, people. Uh, needless to say, we are still probably into the context of conventional practice or high performance building. So our targets uh, are ambitious, uh, but it's ne necessary perhaps to be a bit radical if we want to um, uh, meet uh, all of the requirements of the International Panel for Climate Change or even just the European target for 2015 of decarbonization. Um, but anyway, um, so I'll, uh, I have to be honest, my lecture will not be very organized, uh, but I'll show you. Okay. The project I'm working on now, uh, primarily as a consultant, uh, you're probably able to see uh, the picture I took of the volume, uh, which is about an utopic cube of 400 by 400 meters. Uh, but as you can uh, read from the uh, from the uh, subtitles, um, it's probably going to be the largest uh, uh, building, um, which will be highly characterized uh, by the creation of a, an environment within it. Uh, the object uh, or this cube is located in a master plan of 19 uh, square kilometers. Um, and the uh, regenerative approach, uh, um, it's a bit controversial in this case, uh, um, as uh, it is a massive uh, use of energy to create this condition. Um, and then it's about uh, starting from a collaboration as such in, in most of my work uh, and trying to find the uh, strategies that makes this adapted, for instance, uh, to be um, an element that create more value than the value that takes out uh, from the context. So directly from that to the InDesign and to the climate consultancy I'm making, what are the axes of any type of intervention? Um, first of all, uh, it's about the climate. We know that is harshening in most contexts. Um, it's much less linear. Uh, we have a shift, uh, as you can see from this thermodynamic chart for a full year, uh, where we have shift of temperature uh, that in most cases uh, are about of seven degrees. So from now to 2050, uh, we have an, a delta temperature, increase of temperature of seven degrees. Uh, this is something that we can decide to mitigate by emitting less. Um, but given that this pattern, are, uh, this course, uh, it's for the most uh, uh, not stoppable, not reversible, uh, but it can also only uh, be uh, somehow mitigated. Uh, what it comes into play is how do you use these changes um, as a way to make new architecture? How do we factor and we plan for the seven degrees more that we're going to have in a few years? Um, so, uh, also when it comes to um, 
and then I go back, of course, to the course of the um, of, of the of the of the um, of the lecture. Uh, but what we have uh, it's an increase of radiation primarily, uh, which makes certain sites as such uh, very similar to condition that you may have on Mars, uh, for instance. Uh, um, and what do we mean by climate change? And why do we call it, for instance, scenario 8.5 or 5.5 or 2.5? This is the amount of energy that a site received more from atmosphere as present in what for uh, what um, uh, under square meter. Um, when we say odd eight and a half, it means that we have a, a radiative increase of energy of 8.5. So that's a big stress uh, on a site. And um, uh, it's very important to understand how do we cope with this newer uh, condition, which also leads uh, to very much uh, new types of the temperature. Um, so uh, I will show in this lecture a few approaches to that. Uh, also uh, accounting that um, this type of information uh, are pretty much related also of newer uh, fluid dynamic patterns. So differential temperature within a site, uh, um, which can be at the mesoscale, but also these happenings are within the buildings so or in between space uh, um, that characterize uh, uh, public, uh, public space, open space. So all this movement and thermodynamic uh, layers uh, uh, are those that uh, we are going to discuss uh, within the presentation. And we see how, uh, through means of architectural technology, uh, it's possible to address that. And it's an approach which is about adaptation uh, to the changes, uh, find harmony um, uh, within this new uh, thread uh, that we are having into uh, context. Um, so back into uh, our uh, presentation, uh, I'll show other sites and other happenings. Uh, for instance, this is uh, for the city of Bologna, uh, where we are consulting um, uh, together with uh, uh, the School of Sustainability uh, for certain uh, revised action. Uh, we see in 2050 that there is actually uh, a perceived temperature within the city that varies from zone to zone. We can see how certain area uh, have an outdoor comfort or, or a real feel of about 42 degrees in 2050, whereas certain areas uh, offer uh, much wider uh, ranges of high temperature for the city center. When we go on the outskirts of the city, we can see that temperature are not so uh, different. In this case, you see a river in the central section. And we see also some living system or vegetation of a different kind. Uh, temperature are lower uh, in certain areas, but not so much lower. Um, and now it's a little bit of uh, focus. I promise this is the only moment of focus of the whole uh, communication. Um, let's have a look on how temperature increases in the last row by how many degrees for different parts of the city, from the center to the residential outskirt, to the industrial part, to the agricultural site, to site uh, uh, with the river and forest. In red is the highest increase of temperature that we can experience for the sites. You may be a little bit curious about the fact that major increase of temperature are not in the city center, but are more into the agricultural site or even into the forest or wherever there is a presence of vegetation. So the question could be why, um, whatever it's um, uh, a living element, um, it's stressed by so much increase of temperature. The answer is pretty simple. Uh, vegetation system, ecological system, and we model all their functioning uh, at different temperature and under different stress of radiation are those that uh, enter into uh, a stress. And for instance, you may have noticed in Vienna, I was there uh, this summer uh, at the GBS school. What I've noticed is that most of the green roofs is quite, are quite dry. Uh, the green roof actually are most of the time not able to cope with high temperature combined with high radiation. And this is happening today, but imagine in a few years how much that uh, can increase. 
So living systems are those that have less capacity within just one generation to adapt to newer conditions. And that's why at global level, you have migration of species from southern location to our northern location. As you know, different species have different seeds. Uh, in many cases, these are um, eaten by birds and birds move. Uh, where the seed find the right condition grows, and that is what leads to new layer of vegetation or... Um, so, um, so one first message I want to carry uh, to you um, when it comes to the generation in this case is that climate change stress the most the living system. And whereas everyone speaks about urban heat island with climate change, what we have, uh, um, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, the stress of the area around uh, uh, this uh, kind of uh, uh, thermal island that are the center of the city. So with climate change, uh, what will be stressed is not the center of the city, but is the surrounding and all the natural presences. And that's why perhaps as architect, we need to think on how do we relate with that? How architecture can become one layer of protection of this um, uh, situation? Uh, so just with two degree of difference, uh, according to all of our models, what we see is that uh, uh, we have a strong uh, type of stress on biodiversity um, and in all the uh, uh, phenology, uh, for instance, all the pollination. So when the plants or the flowers are ready, um, the insects are not and vice versa. So there is a desynchronization or an alteration of cycle that used to work uh, very well until recently. Um, so uh, implication are on the ecosystem. Uh, perhaps I'll drop to another uh, presentation because I think uh, it's worth investigating a little bit uh, uh, more of that, uh, if you allow me to do so. No, I don't have it here. Um, anyway, so um, what we have is a correspondence between um, uh, increases of temperature and from one side, uh, capacity of survival of certain species. Uh, we have impact on uh, pollution. We know that with increase of temperature, uh, in general, we have um, an increase of pollutants. Uh, also, vegetation, when it dries, uh, it produces uh, certain chemicals uh, like volatile organic compounds, like those emitted by plastic. But these are uh, actually emitted by uh, plants, uh, which are quite harmful to human as well as uh, to other, um, to other uh, living species. Um, so there is a decay of the generation uh, that we need to play with. And just to mention also the health uh, in general, and this is for the specific study uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, what we have is that there is, for instance, an increase of uh, respiratory diseases or death due to that, uh, because despite people are uh, smoking much less or not smoking, uh, on a average, uh, the pollutants that are in atmosphere, uh, and despite there is an electrification uh, of uh, and a rationalization of the transports, what we have uh, is that increase of uh, uh, the potential of being harmful of substances uh, within the atmosphere. Um, but um, other war, in fact, is the increase of skin diseases, uh, uh, skin cancer are on the raise, and this is all due to this radiative increase of um, radiation that uh, we discussed uh, earlier. So um, let's have a look also at other side of the story. Uh, this is a consultancy for the city of uh, Gothenburg in Sweden, uh, where um, actually, especially in the suburban parts, which are, as mentioned, those that are more exposed, um, there is an issue of uh, increasing temperature. And um, as we uh, uh, actually enter into a climatic crisis uh, of its own body, already at 27, 28 degree. Uh, but also there is a certain issue related to vegetation and certain invasive uh, type of species. So we create uh, very wide uh, microclimatic models. Uh, you may know that there are two types of models when you do these studies, that are the mesoscale regional models, mostly based on information from the satellite. Um, and then there is another way uh, which is more accurate uh, as it becomes closer to architecture and it allows dynamically to understand all the interaction between the building and the context. Uh, so in this microclimatic model, 
all type of speeches are uh, actually feature uh, understanding how do they behave uh, in terms of evaporative transpiration for instance um as well as they are put in place and all the buildings are modeled creating this coupling um so uh, that leads to an understanding of uh, temperature like in this case uh, uh, on the outside and on the interior of the building uh, you can already see on the on the left, uh, how there is very high temperature even nowadays. Uh, these are model calibrated with local uh, measurements with uh, um, a series of uh, weather station. Um, and already there are several units that goes above 35 degrees. When we look at the picture for 2050, we can see how air temperature, and this is central Sweden, uh, it's very high. On the outside, we can experience temperature up to 40 degrees. And within the building, also, we have very, very high uh, type of temperature. Um, so um, how uh, is possible to cope with that, with this new uh, trend of temperature? Um, so uh, these are four curves related to buildings of different epochs uh, built uh, in Gothenburg. And uh, we have very isolated building, like passive owl uh, standard uh, or so, which are these in red. During, and this is uh, basically the uh, amount of uh, energy which is exchanged, uh, gaining energy above zero and losing energy below zero. And this is the 24 hour of the day. During the day, typically building assume um, um, capitalize energy. Whereas during the night, they tend to dissipate energy towards the context. So what we uh, first see is that uh, buildings that are highly isolated, uh, during day do not accumulate energy, this is the red flat curve, and during night, they do not release it. Even with uh, uh, introducing some ventilation, uh, buildings are uh, actually very uh, resilient uh, into losing uh, energy toward the context. Ventilation uh, only to some extent allow to lose energy. We look then in blue, for instance, this curve, of a building built in the 70s. We can see how during the day there is certain accumulation of energy, but during night there is a massive loss of energy, especially into a context where night experiences a drop of temperature. Even more interestingly, a building which was bu buildings that are built in the 70s are unlocated close to living system, which further are able to decrease their temperature at night, uh, release much more energy. So in a way, what we have is that the building, when it's less isolated, begin to collaborate uh, uh, with the context. Um, and for us, uh, and we have repeated this study for several locations. It's a very interesting study, as we could see also in several studies in Germany and in Denmark about passive housing. Also, I can send you some paper about it. What we have recorded is actually that um, uh, in mid-season and summer, less isolation may be a fruitful uh, strategy, especially for buildings that are residential. Those where um, it's possible to discharge them during night. So. That is the second message I want to bring you, is that depending on the site, the envelope may change. And be a little bit skeptical when you find the fixed uh, solution uh, from norms. Uh, it's possible probably to find smarter solution, uh, creating a dialogue to the context. Um, so the third project relates to the adaptation to climate change of the PFL uh, campus. Uh, I was. Uh, for three years uh, collaborating with LESO, um, uh, led uh, back in the days by Professor uh, Jean-Louis uh, Scartezzini, that uh, just recently retired. And uh, we worked on model the full campus, uh, understanding what are these thermal happening between uh, indoor uh, and outdoor. Um, and how was possible to modulate them um, in order to um, give uh, more information for landscaping, but also for the form and the making of this new building by uh, Kengo Kuma, for instance. Um, so uh, this is pretty much based on, first of all, on the understanding of metabolism. This means uh, 
collect data with block glob, black globe thermometer, like in the left, uh, understand the anatomy of it uh, through thermal camera measurements, and also have wind profiles through the wind uh, tower. These are very useful information when you begin to calibrate uh, models. And these are uh, findings of thermal exchanges uh, that are happening between these uh, uh, different buildings. This is the um, Rolex building by Sana, the mechanical engineer uh, building by Dominique Perrault. And here we have this building uh, by Kengo Kuma, which was mostly the object uh, uh, of some of the feedbacks. Um, so we know that each building depends on form and material as a different exchange toward the outside. So each configuration leads to different, uh, let's say, uh, energy profile. But also we know that the site, if we mesh it, perhaps is not the best mesh, but uh, um, uh, theoretically in simulation, what we have to have um, uh, to compare best, uh, it's a uniform uh, type of mesh, but we have a, uh, an average value uh, for each of the mesh that provides a very useful information for landscaping and also to understand what is the comfort um, uh, within the site and what are the critical area. So when uh, given information for landscaping, for instance, uh, we could see that certain area could easily lead uh, to a temperature in summer at peaks um, of 80 degrees or more. Uh, and similarly, the new building on the upper left um, is, is being surrounded uh, by temperature as such. Each object on the site exchange energy by long wave. And on top of that, there is a short wave coming from the sun. And uh, very importantly, what surfaces reflect uh, on the site, which is again, a uh, short wave. Uh, we could see that uh, first of all, um, by measuring, that uh, temperature profile already for today are very high. But when we begin to calibrate model and project this uh, for 2050, we see how temperature can increase uh, very much due to, due to this radiative um, increase uh, uh, of energy coming from the, the sun. So certain material are more or less uh, stable. They will not change temperature from today uh, into 2050, but some other uh, will not be so intelligent uh, when into context. Uh, this also relates a little bit to the research uh, that I'm performing um, with Professor Matt Santamuris uh, in UNSW, um, where um, he primarily and his team have developed for several years uh, intelligent uh, material, uh, which are able to be a subambient temperature. Uh, so these material have, have both high emissivity and high reflectivity. They play both with short wave and long wave, uh, which means that if we have on the outside 32 degree of temperature, for instance, they may, may be able to be around 29 degree or 28 degree. So uh, probably um, when we look into the uh, tech uh, of material, those can be interesting type of solution. Uh, but let's see how the feedbacks in, may have impacted uh, some of the development. Uh, for instance, we see a big cantilever here, uh, knowing that it's very important uh, to protect the facade from very high radiation. All the landscaping uh, needed to be informed by that. So living system that reduce temperature are incorporated, as well as high reflective type of concrete are into context. Notice how the envelope looks like a honeycomb in the sense that there is this uh, collaboration that we mentioned before from indoor to outdoor. So the envelope is about to breathe and be in tune with the temperature that are into the context. Um, so uh, in that case, the building becomes um, uh, operating uh, with almost no energy, especially being this uh, a building that uh, has um, uh, art display function, um, it, it can work because people are not sitting steadily like in an office, uh, but there is a movement, is a show. Um, some information um, uh, about, uh, and these are some modeling back in the days on what it can happen. So uh, especially into summer, 
um, if we incorporate the decision to have isolated material versus uh, uh, transparent material as uh, the one we mentioned, we can have two, uh, in average two or three degree less uh, uh, within the building. Um, and uh, also when it comes to the surrounding uh, uh, temperature, we can see that uh, there is an exchange between the interior and exterior, uh, which is a, a bespoke thermodynamic communication where also the outer uh, can be, um, uh, let's say, uh, at a better thermal place, uh, if it's possible to have this uh, constant flow between indoor uh, and outdoor. Um, and when we look in winter performance um, um, as well, uh, there is just a minimum losses uh, of uh, temperature within the uh, context. I will leave you the slide so you can uh, get back to the numbers uh, later on if you're curious. Um, also, you may uh, recall that there was a very red patch uh, on this side. And as we know, uh, convection is one of the aim, uh, one of the possibility to reduce temperature. But when we would, if we would look uh, at outdoor comfort, it's very important. Uh, always not to abstract flows, but even to design flows um, so that it's possible to uh, create a better layer of uh, ventilation. Ventilation works uh, in a very simple way. Under 36 degrees is very beneficial. Uh, above 36 degrees, uh, it's better to avoid ventilation, like where I am now in Dubai. When it's over 36 degrees, if you have ventilation, the transport a flu uh, uh, air at a temperature of 37, 38 is like if you place um, an air dryer uh, to your body. So uh, when temperature is higher of the body temperature, uh, then ventilation uh, is an issue. Uh, this is more or less a basic principle to be implemented. We can see how the development then progressed also with a high reflected type of roofing. Uh, and now all the context, uh, yeah, Perhaps you have visited it. Um, uh, it's hosting uh, right now. This is an old picture, but now, right now, there is a series of features that are uh, aimed at reducing uh, temperature. Um, let's talk a little bit uh, of ecology. This is a consultancy for the Lavazza headquarters in um, uh, Torino, uh, which is uh, meant to reduce temperature uh, within the context. Also play uh, widely with water accumulation in different form, especially in summer in Italy, uh, this is Torino, temperature is hot, dry, which means that we need to inject mist, moist um, into atmosphere, um, promote evaporation um, and evaporative transpiration of uh, uh, plants. So this is, a, let's say, an element that within the context uh, it's supposed to create this type of feature, but it's not as simple as I'm telling you now, and I will explain you the reasoning of why uh, having a strategy as such is quite uh, complicated and controversial. Uh, the building also um, have a shape uh, uh, inspired by the solar envelope concept. So whenever and wherever uh, comes uh, into play uh, the sun uh, during winter, uh, this will never be obstructing the surrounding. So a regenerative building is also a building um, that promotes uh, condition uh, also for the context um, and that respect the other building into the context and even create um, and facilitate good condition for the whole community and the whole district. Um, so when it comes to uh, water and vegetation, uh, the idea was is to collect water as it comes in certain feature, also have sort of design of what is the the, um, the fluid uh, the fluid movement, and most of it um, uh, when it rains is kept on site without releasing to that to the faucet. Um, and we notice through a set of measurements um, by how much uh, temperature air temperature was reduced as compared to the context. Um, and it's true that depending on the type of vegetation, the location, and if it's a green roof, uh, vertical gardens, or it's vegetation spread within the context, uh, uh, there is a certain efficiency in temperature reduction. Uh, but this uh, is something that doesn't come at any cost. Uh, first of all, uh, we experience within the site uh, several deaths of uh, plants. 
um, and uh, by charting the temperature in Torino uh, and the hyperlocal type of temperature, uh, it's possible to see at what temperature a system gets into a crisis. For instance, we know that vertical gardens above 32 degrees, especially if not shaded, uh, um, are into a crisis. That's why it's very important, for instance, when we think of green roof, to extend the design also to shading system, layer of protection, so that uh, we may think vegetation in a different way. We always conceive vegetation as a layer that protects us and creates an habitat for us. Now we have to create an habitat for plants in order to create an habitat for us. So we have to think of an architecture that uh, protects plants, interact with plants, so that they can survive at this higher um, uh, uh, temperature above which they would uh, otherwise die. But if there is a good protection and a good irrigation, we can extend this comfort zone uh, for plants. Secondarily, uh, all the system requires uh, a lot of water. That's why it's very important to keep uh, in any raining event uh, water within the site. We know that one of the efforts of climate change is the reduction of hydraulic flows into context. So uh, uh, what is happening is that uh, most of the water is migrating uh, from earth to the sea. That's why there is a sea level increase. Uh, but the effects are tangible into the city. Uh, the Alps have, uh, uh, for instance, uh, much less uh, uh, outsourcing of water. Um, the rivers are always uh, or often dry, uh, or the amount of water um, that uh, comes into the river less. Um, so we need to find strategy in our design to keep water within the uh, within the site without releasing that to the uh, faucet if uh, possible. So of course, all the permeable surfaces. Uh, uh, should be uh, studied as such. Okay, another project. Uh, this is in the Faroe Highland. is a consul uh, consultancy for big, um, and um, here it's about uh, uh, the airflow and the dynamic of airflow uh, in the Faroe Highland. Uh, this was uh, a, very, uh, a project of a few years ago. Uh, where um, we begin to study um, a little bit how the patterns are changing within context um, and also um, how the intensity of storm uh, are and how airflow uh, velocity is uh, changing. Uh, these are quite uh, interesting data um, as um, uh, when we think of a regenerative building, which is able to offer uh, not only protection within its wall, its wall but also within the context, um, uh, those are factors that uh, uh, may be impacted. Um, as, for instance, the traditional settlements are now experiencing much higher velocity and hour of discomfort for community that lives uh, on already an extreme climate. It becomes then... Uh, very important even to recover marginal hours uh, of use of the site or extend the livability of the context uh, for as long as possible. Um, also, within the Master of Extreme Environment uh, uh, at the Royal Danish Academy, uh, of uh, which uh, I col uh, collaborate as a scientific uh, responsible, um, uh, and under the lead of um, uh, David Garcia, uh, who is the uh, head of the Master, um, we develop um, three, four hundred, um, let's say, um, uh, tools as such. Uh, I think I will be given later also some example. Uh, but those are very interesting uh, because our medium uh, for understanding climate change, for instance, this is a system uh, made by one student uh, that tried to capture the form of wind um, and how this impacts and generate uh, uh, an architecture. This type of fundings becomes very interesting when uh, they have to inform later on an architecture. Um, and it was clear to us from all the studies um, and different type of testing in different settings, that it was necessary to create building that was not just aerodynamic. Generally, when do you do an aerodynamic building? You do an aerodynamic building uh, when you want to have, uh, let's say less turbulences, Let's um, 
pressure on surfaces also for static dimensional uh, reason of uh, structural elements. Uh, but in general, when you have wind going well around the uh, building in a site where velocity is very high, you're not going to reduce velocity. You're mildly going to increase even velocity. So what you want to achieve uh, is protection. And that's why the building is uh, intentionally not aerodynamic, but it creates a deviation of uh, velocity, as you can see here on the left. Uh, so that depending on uh, wherever and whenever the wind come from, so the wind rows that have, uh, uh, let's say, sculpted uh, this building is quite complex. Uh, but independently from when the wind come from, there will be always one side that which is uh, protected. Um, and this shape uh, soon became interesting uh, in terms of uh, uh, creating a, a mix between aerodynamicity and um, between uh let's say protection um also because it's offering a very interesting performance from uh, the lighting point of view um especially for classroom like in this case um, and especially in a context where we know light is very uh limited resource uh, within winters um it's uh, it became interesting to have a coupling of different strategy like this of daylighting with a big atrium within the site. And also if we think thermodynamically in terms of heat exchanges, having a compact body, uh, which the best surface to volume ratio um, is the one that actually allows to, uh, to have less dispersion of heat. So multiple performance have then uh, impacted what is the final shape of the uh, of the building. Uh, all sides, um, all sides uh, are um, glazed. Actually, there is none element uh, which is opaque, uh, which is not related to a structural function, in order to have the best propagation of the lighting. Uh, and also you can see here the introduction of some colors uh, and this it's a circadian thinking uh, in a way to uh, mm, play with the wavelength of the visible, uh, giving it a color uh, as a way to stimulate uh, uh, different type of uh, frequencies and uh, hormone um, uh, secretion in our body. It's very important, especially when you go into this site to create uh, uh, a vibration uh, into the light. Um, a consultancy undergoing, um, it's uh, for uh, Fiumicino station in uh, Rome. Uh, it will be the new uh, train uh, station uh, terminal. Um, and as you can see, uh, this is the slope uh, with some air inlet uh, and some daylighting uh, inlet, uh, and also some flag on the side. Uh, it looks a little bit like a, a Formula One uh, car, uh, we can say that. Uh, and that is because it's actually uh, primarily inspired by uh, our reasoning on uh, ventilation. So uh, Italian train station by 2050 will have to be operated with no use of energy and possibly be energy positive. So it's necessary that all acclimatization is uh, passive by all means and ventilation uh, becomes then one of the primary drivers. Uh, so to study that, uh, what we did uh, is to look on how uh, Fiumicino Airport works. Uh, we begin to see that uh, actually plane, depending on the wind velocity, um, land into one uh, direction or the other. It can be the blue or it can be the yellow. In summer, the yellow uh, primarily and in winter is the blue. Um, and then we collect the several data from uh, the airport, uh, which is actually where the station, uh, the train station is. Uh, it connects basically the uh, airport to the center of Rome. And we use that uh, in a fluid dynamic uh, term uh, in order to uh, define uh, all of the elements. Um, so uh, it's possible to have um, uh, in summer ventilation that enter from this side and exhale uh, from this side. Whereas in other season, there is a cross ventilation that happens on the other side. On the other hand, when air is very static, these elements have 
black or darker color um, um, panels, which eats up and it's possible to have a stack effect, which is repeated uh, in different parts of the building. So by doing that, uh, what we accounted for, uh, it's uh, a much uh, sensitive uh, save of energy. Actually, um, introducing, for instance, just a mechanical ventilation, uh, we have a cons uh, an energy consumption of about 200 kilowatt hour per square meter per year, which corresponds to an emission of uh, 40 kilogram of CO2 per square meter uh, per year just per operation, which is, uh, I think, still a big number. Uh, so, uh, especially if we multiply by uh, the large size uh, of this type of uh, infrastructure. So, uh, by adopting you know, a, a building which is studied for natural ventilation since the shaping um, would imply then a reduction of about a fourth of uh, both emission and uh, energy use. These are just uh, some energy related to some mechanization of some uh, or some system. Uh, and I have to say that um, it's very important uh, to consider already uh, the uh, wind pattern, for instance, in this phase, as if you design a building and then you just optimize for mechanical ventilation, you will never achieve this type of performance. Even with natural ventilation, it will work, uh, let's say, relatively, and you will never achieve uh, uh, such type of uh, low uh, energy consumption for this infrastructure. Uh, needless to say, uh, this uh, kilowatt hour per square meter, especially with an increase of radiative um, uh, power from the sun that year by year um, will feature our future, uh, it's very easy to be offset uh, with mechanical uh, with uh, photovoltaic system uh, on on the on the on the roofing. Um, or um, it's very important that, um, uh, to, to notice that the photovoltaic system doesn't have to be into the building. It's a district type of thinking where the energy flows uh, across uh, different spaces, uh, or it can be uh, even located in another, uh, in another site. Uh, let's talk a little bit about health. Um, and um, uh, this was uh, one of the uh, building um, consultancy for uh, within the American context, and this is some years ago, which was the NASA Sustainability Base, uh, where I was uh, consulting uh, William McDonough, uh, the author of uh, Cradle to Cradle, um, which was the lead architect for this type of project. Uh, between us, um, uh, um, William McDonough and um, his team was very strong when it comes to the cycle of material, but when it comes to energy, daylighting, um, and climatic type of thinking uh, uh, that was not the core expertise of the uh, office uh, uh, office. So uh, the building feature an exoskeleton as such, uh, which is quite, um, um, this building is clearly uh, an architecture inspired by, uh, for instance, mission into the space. You can uh, recognize the language if you have seen uh, some uh, uh, movie about space and surroundings. Um, and all of the systems or the passive system were uh, about shaving this type of incoming radiation into certain season, especially all this yellow is a big patch of energy that comes into the building in summer um, or across the year, let's say, with peaks in summer, obviously. Uh, and all the system, and I'll just show you uh, the west side, were designed and optimized back into the days to take off all of this coming energy. The overall idea back in the days was to, if you work here, here, or here, you will have the same condition of daylighting, the same temperature, uh, the same uh, type of relation to the context, and so on. It was kind of a uniformization. Quite, uh, almost we can define it as uh, this um, uh, homologation of spaces. Uh, in, in the recent years, I've been more and more in contact with uh, Professor Kramer, um, uh, whose uh, script you can also find into the book Regenerative um, um, Design in the Digital Practice. Uh, I'll show you the link later. But his theory is quite interesting. He discovered 
that um, uh, and this is what, where uh, physiological science stands today that our body is much more into comfort when needs to work to adapt to different uh, temperature within a context uh, when it needs to um, when in a space you have this homogeneity or different set of temperatures rather than being always in a thermostat temperature for instance of 22 degree uh, our body uh, comes from hundreds of thousands of years of evolution where it needs to adapt needed to adapt to different contexts and that has promoted health and uh, and healthy physiological um, uh, functioning uh, so this is pretty much back it up uh, in a series of study like this in the lower right uh, where we can see how much more um, cells um, are uh, activated when there is a thermogenesis, when there is a process for the body of activation in order to relate uh, to changing uh, temperature. Whereas if we live in a steady state uh, environment, this is a precursor of some chronic disease and uh, not the least, uh, including diabetes. So uh, how to transform that in architecture, very different from the NASA sustainability base back in today, into the days when uh, sustainability was about uh, uh, standardization of uh, performance. So uh, this is uh, the envelope of the Lavazza headquarters we have seen before. You can see here uh, how um, there is a constant fluctuation of um, uh, heat exchange between indoor and outdoor due to the fact that this is a schematic design uh, where all the envelope is designed the same way. And this is what um, the mechanical engineer wanted to discuss the most with me. Um, but uh, in dialogue with uh, the architect, my idea was, what if we do not provide in every space the same type of comfort? What if we create a landscape of different temperature, different indoor mean radiant temperature, uh, different also uh, colors uh, within the different facades. What if we stimulate thermoregulation and we have interior which are much more floating as compared to steady state uh, type of approaches? What if certain panels or certain windows are able to exchange much more energy within the site? What if uh, in winter some place will be colder and warmer and so you have the same condition in summer? Um, what if we begin to think of a seasonal use where people are experiencing uh, the space and decide where to move. So that uh, led to a solution as such, where um, there is double skin facade, uh, thrown by walls, uh, spandra of different colors, as well as grays of different colors, and also overshade of the facade by different elements uh, within it. Um, and uh, this hasn't yet been su supported by a post occupancy evaluation, but it offers on the inside a different layer of temperature that can be explored. Um, so from the first uh, type of feedbacks, uh, what we know is that occupants uh, attempt to have their fixed position, but yet this can be articulated and decided uh, perhaps seasonally or uh, anyway, there is a certain um, uh, trending patterns that can be uh, registered. Um, each of us, of course, has a different thermoregulation, different preferences. So offering this plurality uh, can be something uh, to be explored. Uh, we try to bring the same concept into a tower uh, in Milan, design, design uh, for the Expo, uh, where there is actually a coding of this different temperature in the southern side into this uh, into the west, uh, north, east sides. Um, as well, there is a coding within the ground. The overall idea is to play with incoming radiation, uh, not by a regular pattern, but will reflect uh, in a steady state way uh, heat within the units, this is a residential building. Um, but uh, uh, patterns that are able to bring into the interior energy at different times, at different intensity, uh, and in uneven way. Uh, just to show you how it works, I brought this picture, which is actually in shade. 
just to show how even when it is in shade, the elements bring inside different type of energy. On this black seat, we have different colors, despite this is in shade. And when light comes, it comes, it brings not only uh, the visible, but the visible of a part which is a uh, short infrared, uh, which actually is energy, it's heat uh, that is transferred uh, into the space. Um, so uh, this articulation becomes very interesting um, from the shading point of view, but also from what you have uh, within the space, and you create very different condition between uh, any type of um, uh, unit. Uh, on the other side, there are panels with different insulation thickness. So it means that uh, in the same unit, you have one part which is less isolated than the other, which is more livable, for instance, in summer when temperature and not the night drops, um, and another part which is more isolated. So if we begin to think of units that use um, mechanical system only at peak time, uh, this is a quite interesting and smarter way um, for saving energy, achieve more comfort, achieve variability, stimulate physiological mechanism. As well, on the outer side, you can see how there are different colors. So depending on the season, each of them will have a different temperature. For instance, the black, uh, which in some case intercept some of the benches, uh, can get in winter, even in winter, to 40 degrees, 45 degrees. Uh, so that is interesting. Whereas other type of benches may be surrounded by lower temperature uh, in summer, uh, which stay at ambient temperature, more or less the temperature of the site or slightly more. So this uh, was the uh, one of the concepts. So um, I'll show you now some of the prototype at the different scale. Uh, I have many other building uh, or master plan to show you, uh, but for the sake of time, um, I'll, uh, I'll try to stay and go directly to uh, these uh, examples because from those, I inherit a lot of knowledge, but primarily the student attending the Master of uh, Architecture in Extreme Environment, led as said before by David Garcia. So what we do is to have a first semester where students develop one prototype and then they go to a site. This year, uh, in the first semester, students uh, went to Alain uh, here nearby uh, by uh, Abu Dhabi, and some other went to Jaipur uh, in India. These are contexts characterized by extreme uh, type uh, of condition. And they use um, architectural device, uh, which are able to gather information about the technology, about the form, um, uh, and about the social um, uh, a social nature of interaction. And this uh, information are crystallized then into a scientific assignment, to a scientific paper, uh, which, uh, by the way, this week we are correcting, uh, where. Um, uh, the device, when uh, coupled with a set of sensor, collect information that are used later on into the making of uh, architecture in the second uh, semester. So we published, for instance, this one into the recent uh, uh, architecture uh, world congress in Copenhagen, where this student in the first semester uh, develop um, a microclimate uh, uh, that uh, capitalize on the fishing drawing uh, properties as a way to create a more comfortable site uh, within the context. Uh, this exploration of Jonathan uh, come from the uh, analysis of the uh, fish drying fishing um, uh, facility that are very typical within this context. Uh, for instance, this is again to the Faroe Island. Um, so this um, uh, system is then brought uh, into a context of uh, measurement, and also there is a set of interview uh, with people try to understand what are the performance um, uh, of it. Uh, this was uh, I, I will show you now some example. Uh, I talk off the music because I'm not sure if uh, signals goes through, so I better um, um, uh, take off, take that off. Huh? Uh, but this is a system that um, uh, Alexander uh, developed uh, to uh, create a microclimate within the Amazonic forest. So he learned how to uh, play with latex. Uh, so he cut really the wood and made the latex uh, by its own. 
um, and use upcycled type of uh, hospital bags that you can see in the lower uh, part, those that at a certain point begins to drop. We know that um, in uh, the context of Amazon forest, there is one hour of rain every day, like in several tropical areas, and water is then harvested by the gutter, the bamboo gutter, uh, and this goes through the metallic elements to the pockets, which increase in weight and begin to uh, pull down the wall system. As there is part of the fluid that enters into the pocket, and then simultaneously there is a release, um, the system begins to open when, when temperature it's iring. So these are all objects that place into sight function without any human intervention. They just interlock into the, into the process and offer a performance. Let's see what performance is achieved. This is the dynamic movement. This is uh, the learning of how to make the material. Um, and this is a thermo camera measurement five hours after. We can see how the tube are at much lower temperature as well as the wings. Uh, so that um, a person who is, stands here a few, uh, a few hours after, even within the context of a hot humid, still perceive a much better climate. So this technology is then brought in the second semester to an architectural project where it's scale up uh, for a community within the uh, Amazon forest. Also water, needless to say, can be uh, harvested and we know that there is very high pollution um, uh, into all the river of the uh, Amazon uh, context. Uh, other systems, uh, for instance, um, um, uh, you may, uh, it's very interesting that this guy was a student and now is the director of GXN, which is uh, uh, actually uh, a research uh, company um, that works with 3XN uh, in uh, uh, Copenhagen. Um, um, it's very interesting to see how very young people, like Sebastian last time, which was also one of our students, um, ends up doing uh, very cutting edge research um, and uh, or taking leads of um, uh, of um, uh, of new of established office. Uh, so that's very uh, rewarding for us. He developed a system that used uh, crystal, and these are some work in uh, China uh, that is able to. Uh, filter air pollution by using up, uh, let's say, upcycled um, uh, wool uh, from local uh, workers. This was the waste, which gets into fiber. And then it's very interesting to understand how pollution, when there is um, uh, also a circular approach, which includes also the use of uh, local um, uh, abundant presence of salt, but how this ends up into a system that can be used to purify air and uh, students have to develop uh, the system into details, uh, but primarily have to measure what is the performance of each of the system. In this case, uh, it was a system to understand the particulate at different size, how it is uh, before installation and then uh, in a central point of this tent. The tent uh, uh, is also very dynamic in its movement in order to adapt to wind flows. Uh, you may be able to uh, capture some video in YouTube if you go to Architecture and Extreme Environment uh, webs, uh, web depository. Um, so uh, other systems uh, deals with water. Uh, perhaps for the sake of time, I will not show uh, all of them. I'm a little bit uncertain of how much time I have. Um, um, but some other, uh, for instance, in Alaska, when NASA worked... Uh, uh, very closely, um, uh, especially with uh, uh, the head, uh, David Garcia. Uh, but we try to understand how permafrost melting can become a resource, uh, how it's possible to, uh, for instance, uh, get uh, uh, nutrients uh, from the melting, how it's possible to create protein, or how it's possible to make energy uh, by harvesting the methane uh, that come from the uh, the melting. Um, so uh, actually, uh, there is a lot of contents into ice, um, and all the work of 
uh, the student in that case uh, was related to develop a metan extractor, uh, which allowed throughout the topography and different contexts to understand the setting of his future project, uh, um, an architecture on the permafrost. Uh, with sample tubes, uh, a deployable balloon, because it's very important then to visualize the happenings that we have uh, on a site, uh, so that the data are not only harvested, but are communicated through movement. So there is almost uh, an artistry um, in to uh, visualize uh, uh, the performance. Uh, so that becomes a medium of communication with local community, other than be an information uh, for a project that can be uh, developed uh, later on. Um, but uh, when it comes to uh, material, there are several exploration. Perhaps I'm going to show this one again uh, in uh, Alaska, uh, where Tiago um, developed a system that uh, focus on create nicer environment for people into Alaska. As we know, into extreme climate, there is a tendency of not uh, opening much the doors in order to not lose energy. But also there is a poverty when it comes to food quality because most of the food is imported, vegetables come from far away. Uh, as, and so contaminants, poor food, uh, lack of daylighting um, are something that in a circular type of thinking can be uh, resolved. Uh, so how to match food insecurity along with permafrost to our wing? Uh, so Tiago developed a system, which is, let's say, an evolved hydroponic one, uh, where uh, featuring an interior, he develops a system that sequestrates CO2 uh, from the indoor. We know that most of the vegetable system do so, but... Uh, systems that are, are based into protein into water do it even much faster. Spirulina is one of the, for instance, uh, algae that sequestrate a lot of CO2 to grow. Um, uh, but this system is quite interesting because it has an architectural form that maximizes these exchanges uh, and this sequestration of CO2 uh, by creating as final uh, out product uh, protein that can be um, uh, sourced as food. Uh, so this layer of circularity is are those that are at the basis of uh, this type of uh, education. Find systems that are self-working uh, and that provide uh, a performance on multiple uh, multiple type of layers. So the system at the very end is able to absorb and reduce um, CO2 contaminants even during our occupation below 600, um, 600 uh, particles of CO2 per square cube. So um, at the same time, it's producing um, some sort of uh, uh, lighting. Okay. Um, I'll show you another couple of examples, um, as I believe uh, I have probably not more than 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, this is for Marrakesh, um, where uh, three years ago, or four years ago, the students went to uh, Marrakesh and other cities trying to capture main issues uh, and transform uh, negativity into positivity, degeneration into regeneration, if we want to link to the title of the lecture. Uh, those contexts are quite polluted. High CO2 from cars, uh, CO2 from burnings, um, and this is creating a, a big thread uh, into the context. Uh, on the other end, there is a substitution of local planting uh, with new types of activities. Um, and food production, which used to be partly into the city, like in Marrakesh, is then brought into the other context. Uh, also, there is an interesting resource within the site, uh, which is clay. It's a material that you find everywhere, even in a not yet developed uh, site. Um, and the overall concept of this work is how do we take CO2 into the, from the atmosphere, which is pollution, as a matter for facade that grow uh, vegetable at a higher rate 
how do we create um, a system uh, pottery based uh, that uh, uh, for instance grow uh, tomato so several studies uh, were uh, done on different shape of these uh, casting systems uh, leading to autonomous uh, type of uh, unit where uh, clay is then combined uh, with ground and seeds and then those are installed uh, into facades. I'll take a chance to drink some water. And then the fans, which accelerate the air exchange that we have within the area of growth. So within this process, we notice that uh, uh, when actually there is a, a system, maybe a, a total passive system, like in this case, that use the outlet, again, another element of circulate. This is the water which is dropped by mechanical system, which are widely diffused within the city. What we can see is that there is a highest carbon uh, capturing as well as a faster uh, type of growth. So these are uh, those sort of uh, equation that uh, as architect, regenerative architect, uh, we try to insert uh, in our uh, development. Um, the same student that went to Alaska the year before uh, was in Tanzania. Um, and he dealt uh, with the topic of uh, plastic and release plastic uh, uh, or plastic within the context. I'll try perhaps to increase velocity so uh, you can see how it works uh, in a faster way uh, and it's almost embarrassing the level of um, uh, plastic which is just left on the street and it becomes natural to think on how do we use it in an immediate way in a simple uh, type of way so uh, Anders um, developed a system uh, which is portable, is bringing that in his uh, pack uh, that allows to uh, create a casting, a fast casting for corrugated uh, um, uh, roofing, for instance, but it can be other type of elements like window. Um, uh, that is very playful. So kids are able to harvest uh, several of those. And then there is a game on the making It becomes quite a playful moment. I'm sorry there is no music because that it's uh, definitely adding uh, to the experience. And it creates different type of patterns. Uh, uh, also the language of uh, what is possible to obtain, it's quite varied, obviously. And then this is brought um, into uh, a component of different kind, different type of experimentation. And then working with locals, it's possible to arrange that uh, into a system as a window like that. And then at night we can see and have this vision. Okay, there are several others. Uh, some it's about using highs as a material and create uh, composites uh, that are meant to stabilize uh, waterfront, especially when it comes to um, reduction uh, of uh, the, the the waterfront. Um, and how do we secure the waterfront not to from being uh, eroded? Um, uh, from time to time, and also how can we think, especially within this context of an architecture which is beyond the one made by ice, uh, which use um, and is prone to a better uh, thermal regulation by creating composite uh, with ice. So this project uh, feature uh, several um, ways to dealing with this uh, erosion. Uh, 
which is actually something that uh, already forcing some community to leave the place. So this those site uh, most of the time needs to be uh, revised. Um, and um, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, but uh, it was about the creation of certain composites uh, that are able to uh, stabilize the waterfront in a very intuitive um, and fast way. Um, I'll show you a last video, which is uh, omnicomprehensive. Um, uh, in some case, some of these devices become patent uh, or uh, some becomes product, like in this case. Uh, this was about um, uh, a time of revolution uh, in Chile, as you know, there was uh, a certain economical uh, uh, insecurity uh, within the site, uh, a certain amount of uh, um, uh, of um, um, uh, issue um, as like in this site uh, which is uh, the city of uh, Antafamagosta um, there are conditions where uh, people do not have water water is privatized uh, so uh, most of these informal settling do not have um, uh, clean water and it's a paradox because actually in most cases, uh, uh, clean water is used for um, uh, industry related activity, like the one of the uh, solar batteries. Um, and there is also many inefficiency within the lines of distribution of water. There are several losses um, at several um, at several locations. Uh, on top of that, uh, most uh, units do not have uh, their own electricity. They are not equipped with the uh, light. Um, and there is um, uh, a social tension that comes from this. Uh, so the system in this case is a de desalination uh, system, which purify water, which is able to take care of all the salinity or the higher salinity. Uh, and is easily pluggable into uh, informal settlements and unit, which are primarily built uh, into wood or other type of paneling. Uh, that uh, allows also to harvest energy during the day um, and then provide uh, light at night. And it works very simply in a very simple way. So stu uh, students are able to capture water from the sea and the same elements uh, can then be feeded uh, and provide light as well as uh, uh, um, uh, put energy to place for um, uh, some mute, some um, uh, electrical equipment within the unit. So it's a simple solution. It's one object that, if you know, implemented at a, um, a larger scale, offers a, a multiple type of performance. Uh, so that was, uh, for instance, something that uh, um, is actually um, becoming uh, a real, uh, a real product, as it was very well perceived, for instance, by the community. Uh, the cost of making is quite low, so this has the potential to really become uh, something uh, useful to the community. Okay, so I'll try to wrap. Uh, and. These are some uh, methods for, for working at different scale. Um, I believe that uh, we can uh, today uh, really go beyond what are the specification of um, uh, our design as, um, as uh, it is almost disciplined by um, uh, codes. Um, and we can expand uh, what is the territory uh, of our uh, way of thinking on archi as architect. How do we make any of our creation object that do something positive for ecology? How are buildings uh, are fostering biodiversity? We have uh, designed cities and buildings that keeps uh, nature away from it. But how do we um, create a construction with as this living layer, bio layers, uh, and promote biodiversity? Uh, how our architecture is able to be blue in the sense that it is able to uh, capture flow of water, capture flay, uh, uh, flow of um, uh, of air, um, uh, keeping them within the site uh, without excluding those. When it comes to health, 
how can be building promoting of uh, physiological wealth uh, how is possible how building can uh, be salutogenic uh, using the definition of azimuth which is much beyond what we find in code most of the code uh, or even the rating system today are about creating no harm into people uh, we need to uh, have a building that um, uh, create uh, positive substances uh, that increase our uh, tactility, our reference to them, that increase contactedness with nature or biophilic uh, approaches. Um, and uh, I recently pu published in Springer um, a journal article that talks about what it is the regenerative uh, interior. You may find some references there. And building that decarbonize in two ways. The first way, it's about uh, materials, building that possibly are carbon sequestrating rather than carbon emitting. The second is about operation, buildings that makes more energy than the energy that they uh, produce. Within the realm of climate change, we know that there is an increase of temperature and we need to understand all these patterns, how change the, uh, uh, the location uh, in order to create the setting for these three layers to uh, be happening. So what are the takeouts of today? I'm sorry, I was a little bit un unorganized uh, and I scattered from presentation to presentation. But the idea is not to control any longer the ecosystem, not to control, uh, uh, let's say, the interchange, uh, the bioclimatic interchanges, not to control uh, and create a uh, uh, control environment, but it's to make much more playful uh, system uh, where the happenings are embraced rather than um, opposed to. When we oppose to the happenings, we have to use a lot of energy. Uh, so it is uh, interesting to understand how we can adapt uh, in order to, um, uh, to create new form, new vocabulary, new shape, uh, for technology, new shapes of building uh, in the massing of the building itself, uh, for instance. Uh, so you may uh, find some of this context into this um, uh, book. You can download it for free into a research gate, uh, which is a regenerative design into the digital practice. Uh, most of these work are supported by um, certain intuition, uh, but it's all backed up into simulation that gives us the data uh, to understand how things work or data that are collected uh, on the site. So a certain methodology can be found uh, into this book. Um, I haven't uh, shown many other works, but uh, some are featured in Instagram in Emanuele underscore Naboni underscore climate. Uh, I haven't been very nice uh, in uploading uh, contents lately, but I will try to give it a refresh uh, in the next months. So hope to be in touch um, uh, with some of you and primarily see also what are you up to, what is your work and follow um, uh, some of your uh, developments. Um, yeah, so I think uh, Sandra, this was the last uh, slide. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Emanuele. Um, thank you very much for giving an overview of your approach to the future of tomorrow. Um, we have a few questions in the chat. Um, unfortunately, I think we have only 15 minutes left. So I'll give the students my... Uh, the preference, but I wanted to say that I'm especially impressed by the students' projects you showed, um, and I think they're very relevant for our education concerning the topics that we all have to work on more in the future. So I hope we will have the possibility to talk again soon. And I'll have, let my let some of the students ask you questions. Alexander, you had, I guess, the first question, please. Yeah, thank you very much for the very interesting lecture. I really enjoyed it. It was very interesting to see your approach to all these different topics and how you bring them together. Uh, so my first question that I had was about the EPFL in Lausanne that you showed. Um, 
like right next to the building, there was like this huge paved plaza. And it kind of struck out to me that you're talking about all the designs used for the building. Um, and you were also talking about landscape architecture in the start a bit. But then there was like this, this huge uh, plaza right there and I also Google mapped it. And you could see like, it's like the basically the biggest paved surface besides the parking lot on the entire um, EPFL Lausanne, uh, this kind of like uh, district, I would say. So um, how or in what dimension was this also taken into approach during your research or what were like the, the design principles back there that there's like this huge, you know, like discrepancy between the building, which on one hand you tried to do very uh, research focused and correct in a sense. And then there's like this paved plaza right next to it. Sure, sure. Thank you very much. Uh, brilliant question. Thanks for um, uh, raising it up, this uh, topic. And uh so it's a big matter because uh if we by designing the site or articulating the site uh, we can influence um, thermal performance of the building by even up to 30 percent uh clearly the design of a uh, of a bioclimatic strategy starts from the context uh on a second level um, um it's important to design for the site itself uh, as uh, uh, the site um, it's uh, uh, a place which is lived and so on. So uh, we provide uh, this, uh, all this input uh, uh, back into the days. This was 2016 to 2019 uh, to those uh, making decision and to the architects. Uh, and we had also some meetings. Uh, it was interesting to implement uh, some living uh, uh, elements uh, by uh, the building, uh, the art uh, and engineering center uh, I've showed. Um, and there is uh, yet some part which is um, uh, in uh, concrete. What um, that concrete, uh, it's permeable, I believe, uh, in the sense uh, that um, uh, um, uh, perhaps from the satellite is not visible, but I also recall of your experience on the site. Uh, you may have seen that in certain part is permeable. Um, and it's interesting because uh, so white concrete, uh, it's highly reflective, uh, which take the short wave and reflect it back to the atmosphere. So temperature are lower. Uh, on the other end, there is an issue because um, when you reflect it, this energy comes to our body. Um, so by inserting some permeable surface, um, um, uh, which are these uh, small elements, uh, which are like circles where uh, it's possible to keep some water within the blocks, uh, which in a way uh, mitigate the temperature itself. Um, so um, actually some of the choices are related to mediation when you want to have a gray bodies uh, with certain degrees of permeability, uh, also to stabilize the ground. So it's several factors. Um, um, so uh, I probably have to look into the details of uh, that part uh, uh, now. Uh, uh, but from what I recall, uh, the type of blocks uh, were also permeable. Um, but it's a very complex matter, the one of definition of the right surface, uh, depending on the context. Uh, but when you have very large site, uh, so when the urban canopy, the width to high ratio, uh, it's very expanded. Uh, in general, it's better to have a white uh, or gray body that reflects uh, most of the energy. So actually, we did several simulation comparing scenarios, um, and that was ending up as one of the most uh, uh, effective. Uh, but but it's a good question, definitely. Yeah. Um, Emanuele, can I have uh, an add-on question to that? Because in yes. one of the slides, you mentioned that uh, the water usage for roofs in comparison to vertical gardens were almost the same, 60 to 80%. Um, from our point of view, usually water usage uh, is more intensive for vertical gardens than for extensive roofs. Uh, uh, can you explain that a little bit more? Because I think you explained it in relation to energy use. Um, so I go back uh, to uh, the slide. In, uh, on what it depends, because I, I guess it depends on the climate zone you're in. 
Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> the vertical garden has and the roof has. I, sure, I yes. It would be good to clarify that a little bit more. That's a fantastic type of question. Uh, so uh, this depended uh, on the specific uh, type of technology and the specific type of um, uh, climate. So uh, the more you go south, uh, uh, in theory, there is more need of water for horizontal surfaces um, because radiation hits uh, primarily horizontal surfaces. Um, and uh, another thing, it depends on, uh, of course, the type of species that uh, are hosted. Um, we know that there are certain species that are um, water consuming and others that um, uh, can be occasionally uh, wet. Uh, so these data are just derived uh, from uh, actually the dialogues um, uh, and the data we had for the site uh, according to uh, the specific type of mapping, uh, it's um, so we, what uh, strikes to you is that the vertical garden has this range, this um, uh, as compared to the rooftop garden that uh, looks the same. Um, so uh, in principle, I agree with you that uh, um, depending on the layer of ground, uh, depending on the type of plants, uh, this number can vary. Um, what we find out uh, are these ranges. Um, and uh, so the, the rooftop has much thicker layer than the facade, clearly, obviously. Um, and also some of the vertical uh, gardens were seedless uh, in the sense uh, it depended, this was an average value. Uh, but when we have seedless um, uh, plants uh, that just needs to be into a mist uh, condition or they just need to be watered um, uh, occasionally, that was much more uh, performative. So um, actually, these are the preliminary data that um, uh, offer some information. Um, uh, also, um, uh, there was not enough water for all of this uh, green infrastructure. Um, and uh, this is because uh, particularly in summer, there was a, actually from spring to summer, there was five months of dry times never experienced before. Uh, this is due clearly to uh, climate change. So even the Po River, which is the main uh, river in Italy was dry. So that was a big issue. And cer a certain system um, had to, uh, uh, collapsed because actually uh, irrigation was uh, not enough. Um, yeah, so uh, it's a great point yours. And um, now I'm not an agronomist. I'm trying to put all the picture into a system, uh, collecting data from a, a specialist uh, uh, as it is a little bit into the orchestration of uh, us as architect. Uh, but we see several issues, and it's very important to have more and more of this data to understand what can, uh, can, can what can be uh, uh, understood. Uh, when I was in uh, Vienna last summer, and I begin with a bike to go from side to side, uh, I could really see that, especially all the schools that have uh, green roofs, uh, where have feature all. Uh, a dry roof, probably because during summer there is less occupation, less maintenance. Uh, um, and that was uh, very uh, interesting to see, whereas into the city center uh, vegetation seems for the most to be fine, but I find also several species uh, having hard time and being dry. So even this, vis this visual type of um, understanding uh, can drive us towards certain decision, for instance, yeah. Uh, thank you a lot, Emanuele. Um, Eric, yours is probably the last question. Eric? Hello. Um, Hello. Uh, I wanted to ask if I... you have some... Hi. Thank you for everything. I wanted Thank to you. ask if you have some experience with biomaterials, especially mycelium. 
because in your research you talked more or less more about the classical materials and so i was curious especially about the temperature thing if you have some like research or some infos how the temperature is working with the mycelium sure uh i work at the, thanks for the nice question i worked a little bit uh with sita which is um uh... The center in uh, at the Royal Academy. Um, try to understand path of growth uh, according to temperature. How temperature can be a catalyzer or hinder uh, growth of um, uh, mycelium, and it depends on the type of uh, mycelium. So any um, any uh, living system have uh, has their comfort zone. Um, and high temperature uh, may be impacting that. Um, high temperature uh, are not uh, good for the most of the mycelium. Um, and um, this is why if you take and you look into the city at north, uh, we have this uh, greenery or, some, or spontaneous growth um, uh, of them. Uh, but again, depends on the type of mycelium. I believe that there are different comfort zones depending on the one that you uh, are looking to. Uh, there is also some that grows in oven uh, at higher temperature. That's what I remember from the experiment uh, we did uh, uh, on the site, uh, on, on campus. Uh, but uh, I'm not an expert uh, into that. If you want, you can connect with the Phil Ayers um, at the Royal Danish Academy, which um, uh, or um, Adrian Rigobello is a, now a postdoc at the Academy, who uh, does all of that. Uh, if Sandra wants to host any of them, I can also create the link. So um, <laughs> we can, you can talk very much into the detail in, about Michelium, but probably there is already some lecture about that in your in uh, in the course of Sandra. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Perfect, thank you. Uh, what was the name? Uh, Phil Ayers? Uh, Phil Ayers, or you, or you can reach... Uh, 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 generally, PhD students are more approachable. Claudia uh, Colmo, uh, C-O-L-M-O. Uh, uh, she's actually at the moment doing a lot of experiment on the relation of uh, temperature and uh, growth of uh, mycelium. Uh, perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. And maybe the last question, short, about yes. the, the studies, about the master in, in Copenhagen, the extreme environments. It, is it possible to do it after a normal architecture master? Or is the majority of people doing firstly like a normal master, classical master? I think, uh, yeah, there are both. Uh, um, for, for more information, I can send uh, to Sandra the link and uh, the name of the head of the Institute, David Garcia, who um, is uh, actually the, the person who created the, the format. Uh, I'm just responsible for the scientific part and I follow the students into the scientific development. Okay. Uh, but um, uh, actually there are students, um, uh, there is an intake of about uh, 16 students per year. Um, uh, before I used to uh, work uh, full-time, now I just uh, cooperate in the first semester, uh, which has just ended, and in the second semester I do the simulation courses and stuff like this, but uh, I can put anyone who wants into contact with the, those that do the portfolio selection, so yeah. Perfect, thank you. You're very welcome. All right, thank you very much, Manuela, for this uh, nice quick introduction to a lot of work from yourself. And um, I'm looking forward to talking again with you. Have likewise, a, likewise. Have a good evening. And uh, you too. And um, enjoy winter in Austria must be very nice. At the moment it is, definitely. When snow and sun comes together, it's beautiful. Oh, wow, you're in that context, lucky you. Yes, today it was uh, sunny and snowing. Oh, amazing. That's incredible. I'm very envious. Um, come to Vienna and we talk. Okay. Thank you very much Thanks. For, uh, for your input. Can I ask one last question? All right. Um, I was wondering if the students are uh, choosing the countries or the area by themselves 
um, from the Royal School of Copenhagen, where they work on? Uh, no, actually, um, the master lasts two years, and uh, on-site work it's about uh, one month. But uh, f um, um, in fourth year they go, actually fourth and fifth year go one year to one side, uh, and then the second year they go to another side. Generally, are very uh, radically opposite uh, condition. You can there is. Um, there is always site where there is uh, a crisis given by climate change and there is a need of uh, regeneration um, and uh, and there is a crisis which is environmental but is also social and cultural so it's um, a context a problematic context uh, where climate change uh, it's uh, eroding uh, several type of capitals yeah so it's not chosen, but it's uh, organized trips, let's say. But you stay on the site uh, in quite uh, critical conditions sometimes. I would say, especially when you go in the north, north, very north, uh, with minus 50, or when you go into the Gobi Desert, a plus 50, it's a little bit problematic, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's really interesting to look at these so different works from the students. It's very impressive. Yes, yes. You can see into the, the website. And also, if any wants to talk to David, uh, I think there is also Erasmus exchange possibilities uh, or stuff like this. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Sandra, you're in, into mute. Uh, sorry. Sorry. I'm sorry, but we have to stop because of our course. next lecture is coming up in five minutes. Good luck and enjoy it. Uh, thanks uh, so much for thanks hosting. Again. And talk to you soon. It was a pleasure I, to see you. Uh, thanks, and I will follow your program. It sounds tremendously interesting, so I'll try to follow whatever you put online. Okay. Bye. All the best. Bye. Bye-bye.